From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 152, recorded on May 24th, 2018. Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today in a lovely, sunny New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and it is a, it's one of the best days of the year. I, I said that last time about a day, too, and this is a, an equivalent. It's a little bit warmish, however. I mean, <laughs> listen to us complaining the last time it was a little bit coolish, and now it's a little bit warmish. I guess we're never happy, but uh, this, this comes pretty close to perfection as far as I'm concerned. Also joining us from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. I, my, <laughs> you know, my remote location for the the Twiv listeners is just a few miles from Cold Spring Harbor, right? Right. Where, uh, where Twiv was recorded. In fact, the last three, night, the we three did of us were Twiv. Together. We did a Twiv from Cold Spring Harbor, their forty fourth retrovirus meeting. Had a great time. At which Daniel was a participant. He is still he had a nice and, uh, poster. You and I did a Twiv, which we'll publish one of these days. We did. Saw some nice people. It was people. fun. It was very fun. Yep. I don't. I don't know if our TWIP listeners realize what celebrities you two are. Um, yeah. It was quite something to see the uh, the celebrity phenomenon of having you guys at the it's, retro virology it's a meeting. Full house. It was basically a full. <laughs> house. Yeah, the, the place was full, and the people came in and talked to us. And yeah, wanted to press the flesh. In the jazz lingo, the joint was jumping. I even had some guy. <laughs> I think it was Ron Swanstrom, a well-known retro virologist, asked me to sign his abstract book. Whoa, that's high level. And a lot of people had their pictures high taken level. with us. Yep. I I like that we are becoming uh, popular in science. And the gentleman that I sat next to. John Coffin. Left, I knew him from another time in my life because mm-hmm. I used to go up to Tufts all the time and teach with Jerry Kirsch in the parasitology course. And then I gave a lecture usually as I was up there. And there was this guy, Marty Wolf who was the chairman of the microbiology department at the time. And everyone would show up for this because I think they had to get free pizza or something like this. They, they didn't come because of me, but, <laughs> but I got to meet all these people and you know what? I, I don't, I didn't recognize him because it was like 30 years ago that I was doing that. So he's changed a great Did deal. Did he recognize since then. you? No, but when I reminded him of the fact that I used to go up there, he says, you know, I think I do remember that. And so mm-hmm. it was very interesting to see the uh, time-lapse. So my philosophy is we just keep plugging away. <laughs> we do this, and every week we get more people. We do. And eventually we reach some critical mass. I would, uh, And then it becomes just viral. And plugging, then it just becomes viral. Just after. plug <laughs> and plug and keep doing it week that's, after week that's after right. week. That's right. Until we all drop dead. No one is telling us not to, so we might as well. And you and so, I will drop dead before Daniel, as you know. You don't I, know that. I'm, you don't I'm a little worried. Yeah, I, I think that's going to happen. I'm a little worried about that. But, I do, you know, you bring that up. Why do people say it went viral? Why don't they say it went parasitic? Correct. Is, <laughs> well, I feel slighted. <laughs> it went, uh, yeah, it did. It's a good it question went, you know, because... Uh, Helminthian or something. Because, How about it went geometric? Because viruses, <laughs> viruses, you know, spread and multiply extensively. Well, parasites. Yeah, but more yeah. there are more viruses in a sample than, than a parasite. Always, always. You know? Yeah, but there's no, no yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, but Daniel, it had to do with computer viruses originally, right? Yeah, yeah, but why didn't they call the computer parasites? <laughs> uh, well, they did with worms. They, they yeah, there are some parasites. Actually, and worms. that's true. Yeah, there were worms. I there's remember worms. worms for a while. That's right. Even the astrophysicists have wormholes. So you know, we can get involved in this if we want. <laughs> so. I think we better get on with the show, don't you? Yes, yeah, so let's do our a case from last time, Daniel. Do you remember what we had? <laughs> I, I do actually. I, I've been thinking. I think about these cases a lot, actually. And uh, well, these are real I, cases, right? <laughs> I mean, they are. Yeah, and I think that's why because these are these are not just sort of made up. Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of times, actually, I'm going to be um, possibly teaching over in Scotland in a few months, and and one of the reasons that I'm going to be doing that is a lot of times when you're teaching global health to people, you you create cases, right? You know, teaches. You yeah. know, cases are supposed to be teaching ones. And I love these cases because on our show, they're they're real people. 
And I, I think that that adds a certain dimension. So here is a, a real person that, you know, you, I really connected to when I saw her. And so let's um, let's remind everyone uh, who uh, tuned in last episode and everyone who's tuning in for the first time to hear the case now that uh, we presented a case of a, uh, a lovely young woman in her 30s. And she was the mother of two boys that we had actually talked about on a previous uh, TWIP. Uh, one of those boys uh, was having problems with scabies, keeping himself and everyone else up at night. And now we get to this woman who tells us that she's been having uh, abdominal pain for about three years. She describes this as this fullness, this bloating in her lower abdomen. Uh, she says that she has not noticed blood in the stool. Um, and I guess we should put in that caveat, right? I think Ben Lebrat, right, made this comment. Sometimes it's hard for people to actually see the stool. Right, because some of these are like overwater toilets, right? Mm, yep. So in this case, um, you know, we we talked to her, and you know, maybe she's not always in a position where she's using the overwater toilet. But so when she is able to visualize the stool, um, she does not notice any blood in in the stool. Um, she does occasionally have loose stools. She describes it um, watery. Uh, she says it's difficult to clean afterwards. So sort of a sticky, pasty, greasy stools. Um, and she had had actually a, a quite a long history where she had originally gone to a hospital, made quite a long trip to be seen. She underwent some testing and, and actually had an ultrasound where she was told, oh, this is an ovarian cyst. And, and what you really need to address your uh, issues is surgery. Uh, she had um, been seen several times and had um, several uh, empiric therapeutic trials, one with omeprazole with no benefit. What does that um, treat, by the way? Excuse me. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, word. actually, no, no I'm, gl I'm glad you bring that up, actually. Um, and, I, and I think I sometimes forget, right? I throw these terms out. So I, I try <laughs> to remember, and I appreciate your reminding. Omeprazole is a medicine um, that's a proton pump inhibitor. It's treat, it treats the um, acid in the stomach. So oh, a lot okay. of people in the U.S. Pepsid, right? Like Prozac. Um, over the counter. So not Prozac. Not Prozac. I didn't mean Prozac. Not, There's uh, another Pro something. <laughs> but but the purple stuff. pill. The purple pill. Exactly. Yeah, this is this is the purple pill. Right. The little purple pill for your, your reflux, your yeah. heartburn. Okay. Acid. okay. So they thought maybe it was that. That, that was not helpful. Mm -mm. Um, so that would be something maybe your empiric trial for, let's say, reflux, heartburn, gastritis, you know, right. sir. Right. Um, she was given albendazole, right? That would be our empiric trial for um, helminth infections. Yeah. She was given azithromycin. Um, azithromycin is an antibiotic. And we, we probably think here in the U.S. Um, or people in the developed world might be listening to us thinking, oh, azithromycin, that's upper respiratory. But mm -hmm. it actually has a good activity against some of the bacterial GI pathogens. So Shigella, Shigella for instance, might yeah, be. Yeah. Um, it's also maybe a better thing to use when you're worried about um, some forms of E. coli where treating them with other antibiotics may um, lead to renal issues, I'll say. Right. Um, she'd gone through all these treatments with no improvement. Uh, so now we see her. And on exam, I had described that she had diffuse abdominal tenderness. And we went ahead, we did a portable ultrasound. And um, the portable ultrasound showed that she had a small ovarian cyst, a little bit larger than a sonometer. This was on the left side. The tenderness did not localize to this area. And then the last thing I mentioned, which was sort of, um, I think what really made me remember this case was a little bit heartbreaking, but she, she, she's now, um, Ben Lebrot and I are doing the ultrasound and um, we're talking a little bit more. And she, you know, she says sort of in a, in a somewhat hushed voice, you know, I, I'm really concerned because of this discomfort, I, I have not um, wanted to be sexually intimate with my husband, and that's really troubling him. And is there a chance that you could talk to him and sort of explain, you know, that that this is a medical problem and that I'm, um, I still, you know, I'm attracted to him emotionally and otherwise. So here's where we are. So we want to try to step in and help this woman if we can. Right. It should be mentioned also that azithromycin has been used in trachoma. Uh, as a uh, curative, and uh, there's an international program in which that drug was actually given away free. Um, and, you know, the sort of like following in the footsteps of ivermectin from Merck. This was a, 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 a Pfizer product, and um, they deserve credit for having given it away, and, and uh, they've cured a lot of people of blindness as a result. I may also add that azithromycin has been found to inhibit Zika virus replication. Really? By obviously an off 
really? target mechanism. Wow. And it wow. is, Daniel shall confirm this, it's one of the remaining antibiotics that can be used against typhoid fever. I'll be darned. Because they have developed extensive and, drug resistance. And malaria. If you give this in conjunction with anti-malarials that are slow-acting, azithromycin can also uh, have an effect on the development. But I understand. Is this correct, Daniel? It has some nasty side effects? Um, well, I'll go back to the first. I'll, I'll confirm what you said about typhoid. And it's actually interesting. When I've um, been seeing patients in India, um, the sort of go-to maybe people think about is a ceftriaxone to treat um, typhoid, enteric mm -hmm. fever, so salmonella typhi. Mm -hmm. I would say enterically acquired because a lot of people don't have diarrhea. They have at belly pain sure. and these um, fevers that very quickly respond to therapy. But if you treat them with azithromycin, um, particularly in India where we're starting to see the drug resistance, they do quite well. So it's a it's a very good it's a very good drug for um, a lot of different things. Um, the the blindness it used to be the number one cause of blindness in the world was. Chlamydia trachomatis. Mm, and uh, Ellis Island, they had a little thing that they would not let you exactly. into the United States. And they had this little hook where they would pull down your eyelid to see if you had this eye infection. Yep. And um, so great work. A lot of people have actually, Helen Keller Organization has been involved quite a bit in really? the worldwide distribution. Wow. Um, which is great. So now uh, we've we've reduced this as a major cause of blindness, and vitamin A deficiency yeah. right. is moved in, um, or I guess has been left as as the remaining major cause. Uh, we've done great things with river blindness, right? We, so exactly. here's Pfizer helping with one. We've got Merck helping with another. That's right, so that's right. That's right. We need more, but uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, azithromycin, I, I think, Vincent, you did mention it um, It could be a little hard on the stomach. <laughs> and so um, sometimes when we treat certain types of um, atypical mycobacterium and you have people on this for months, I'll often have them take the dose right before they go to bed. So the idea is, right, as soon as you go to bed, take your dose, mm -hmm. hopefully your sleep when <laughs> um, it starts hitting you. But the class of drugs, the erythromycins, have um, GI side effects. And actually, sometimes that can be used um, for the side effects for motility enhancement. Do we know how it works? I bet we do. Yes, we do, actually. I'm mean, going to say that or not? No, I'm not going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> okay, all right. Would you like Just to know? I can tell you. I'm very curious. <laughs> yes, I am. All right, let's look up the mechanism of action. First of all, it was discovered in 1980, so it's very... It's a new drug. It is relatively new. Mechanism That's, of action yes. prevents protein synthesis, binds the 50S ribosomal subunit, and inhibits translation. Interesting. There you go. Dixon, could you take the first email, please? But, but you I probably want to know about the modal and receptor binding for the GI side effects. Exactly right. Just exactly let right. You, we'll throw that in. Okay. <laughs> so. First letter, David writes, Dear hosts, I will venture a guess that the Panamanian mother with a painful bloated abdomen and steatorrhea is suffering from giardiasis caused by Giardia lamblia, a parasite which is reported to survive in roof water runoff contaminated by fecal matter of birds, reptiles, or mammals containing infective cysts. Giardia has also been reported to show resistance to albendazole, which may explain the ineffectiveness of the drug in this case. The ovarian cyst might be presented in this case as a red herring, although there have been examples of parasitic cysts caused by multiple types of organisms, including Schistosoma mansoni, Enterobius vermicularis, but searching also brought me to parasitic dermoid cysts, which not, might not which might not be out of the realm of possibility. Thank you again for the informative and educational podcast. Sincerely, Dan David P. All right, Daniel, take that next one, please. Kevin writes, malabsorption in Panamanian woman, TWIP 151 case study, Chicago, <laughs> Illinois, Friday, May 4th, 2018. Weather here, just weather. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a Kenyan at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine who was always amused by the English preoccupation with the weather. <laughs> he said that in Kenya, it was just sunny every day. Nobody He's talked right. about it. He's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I mentioned when I was in Africa, they wanted to know when was the rainy season in uh, New York. And I was a little confused. It's like, we don't really think of it that way. Yeah, but uh, Kenya gets a rainy season, so you shouldn't say that. So Kenya does have a rainy season? You bet they yeah. do. Yeah, they do. November. It's a, in November through uh, January. Hmm. And it, it's important to realize, you know, in it's not like Africa is not like one tiny little spot. So the rainy season is in different areas, right. different right. parts of Africa. Exactly. And, and it actually is the, the motivator for the mass migration of the uh, wildebeest. So, uh, and they go right through Kenya. So I was there during that time. So that's how I knew that. 
Now, the human side of this clinical case begs for the speedy resolution of a mother's chronic misery, thanks to the volunteer doctors who undertake this work. Years of bloating, abdominal discomfort, and the frequent passage of bulky, greasy stools in the tropics cannot be enjoyable. The mother in the case, not the volunteers. Add to this the frustration of nurturing several children with intractable nocturnal scabetic pruritus. It is a small wonder that the patient's sex drive is less than maximal. It is also very instructive to learn that inappropriate surgery is a hazard even in impoverished tropical locations. Hmm. Now, here we get a big long. This is interesting coming up, so it's a little long, but I think it's worth reading. This patient has a combination of symptoms, i.e. a syndrome here, the malabsorption syndrome. Initially, we can apply the law of parsimony. Occam's razor to lump all of our patient's symptoms to a single cause. Many diseases can have a final common pathway of the malabsorption syndrome. The nosology, semantic classification of diseases in this case, would fatigue the most diligent intestinal scholar. Good Lord. <laughs> Wonderful choice of words. <laughs> this is, I, this, I'm enjoying reading this. This is well written. A quick <laughs> mental checklist can give anyone the ability to construct a reasonable answer to the patient lament. Doc, could it be? The mnemonic I use is M M. M I I I I C T. Okay, an illness or clinical observation can be laid at the feet of these causes mechanical, mitotic, metabolic, inflammatory, infectious, iatrogenic, idiopathic, who knows what it is, congenital, and trauma. I have left our psychological, since this should almost always be last in order to avoid overlooking physical etiologies. Since this is a parasitology-focused case, non-infectious causes of malabsorption can be dispensed with. Celiac disease, tropical sprue, inflammatory bowel disease, bacterial overgrowth, chronic pancreatitis, intestinal lymphoma, etc. This leaves infectious causes of malabsorption. Viral disease doesn't fit this case. Bacterial infections, likewise, do not explain the chronicity of this patient's symptoms. We are now up the evolutionary ladder to protozoa. <laughs> and the likely culprit in this case is Giardia intestinalis, known to me from the olden times as Giardia lamley or Giardia, Giardia duodenalis. I've supplied a reference that supports a 42% zero prevalence of IgG to Giardia in a cohort from Panama. We shouldn't adopt a premature closure, however, and give some consideration to other bad actors such as Isospora, Cryptosporidium, Entocytozoan, Cyclospora, though these more commonly afflict the immunocompromised host. Since dermoscopy has figured prominently in the last two TWIP episodes, <laughs> I hope that our moderator can discuss portable microscopy, especially the CellScope, a smartphone-based microscope developed at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I learned about it in a recent New England Journal of Medicine article on onchocerciasis. In the field, if the diagnosis is not achievable by microscopy, one is probably left with empiric therapy which is treating for the most likely diagnosis, always keeping in mind the harm-benefit ratio, which would be quite high if ovarian cyst removal was performed. In this case, empiric therapy might consist of metronidazole or nitazoxanide or cotrimazole. Not to be overlooked are the helminthic infections, the leading candidate being strongyloides, which should be relatively amenable to field diagnosis with a cell scope or other field microscopes such as the NM1 Newton microscope. The treatment here would be albendazole or ivermectin. Finally, the other great imitator, now that syphilis is slightly out of fashion, tuberculosis must also be mentioned, an insidious clinical case with relatively nonspecific symptoms. The diagnosis and treatment of this malady must be left to the lucubrations of the listeners. Thank you again for a very stimulating podcast. And then we get a, um, a few references here. That was a very erudite explanation. This is Cecilia. <laughs> right. I discovered your podcast while listening to the quiz show podcast, Asked Me Another. The topic was, are these real or fake podcasts? I'm a medical technologist employed in the microbiology lab at a children's hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. I've had the privilege of working in Washington, D.C., a Children's National Medical Center with Joe Campos as the microbiology lab director and Judy Sneed as the supervisor. I know Joe quite well. Hmm. Well, not quite well. I've been with him at multiple meetings. Let's put it that way. Let's put it this way. I've heard him talk a lot. <laughs> they were a wealth of knowledge in all areas of microbiology and parasitology. My current supervisor, C. Intravichit, 
has also been a great resource for my coworkers and me. In regards to case study 151, I think she has chronic giardiasis. The biggest clue is steatorrhea, as well as the other symptoms you listed. Although she was given the antiparasitic drug albendazole, it would not be effective against giardia. Occasional diarrhea and the prevalence of giardiasis in Central America would also be consistent with chronic giardiasis. Big shout out to my coworkers. They're the best at teamwork and getting the job done. All right. Dixon. Colin writes, hey, Twip Peeps. Twip <laughs> Peeps. Hmm, that's a first. <clears throat> I know I'm probably too late, but I thought I'd give this week's case a try. Due to the nature of the stool, I would presume there is mucus in the stool caused by giardiasis. Because of the lack of sanitation and their proximity to animals, dogs, and pigs, it could be possible for a member of this population to acquire G. lamblia through the fecal oral route. There may be many other possible diagnoses, so I would suggest testing the stool microscopically over the course of a few days to see if there are any characteristic trophozoites or cysts in the stool. Best, Cullen, he's a molecular biology technician in Atlanta, Georgia. Molecular microbiology. Sorry, molecular microbiology tech. Says Atlanta, tech. Georgia. Atlanta. Okay, Daniel. So I'm I'm wondering if uh, the reference to Peeps is the reference to the Scott Westerfeld um, book Peeps. I don't know if you guys have ever read that. No, no, no. <laughs> What's it all about? <laughs> it, it, it's sort of it's about uh, I guess parasitized um, people. It starts off with a young man, and I, I guess his ex girlfriend has been parasitized, and um, you know taken over and turned into something of a zombie like, like person. body snatchers i think yeah. it's yeah. a science fiction thing okay it's a science it, it's very i peeps. i find it uh, fun. i know so, peeps peeps has these little marshmallow things remember those <laughs> <laughs> okay no you don't know what i'm talking about i have no idea marshmallow candy sold in the u.s shaped in, in the like chicks bunnies chickens? and animals. yeah little oh peeps. Yeah, okay. they're called they're peeps. peeps i didn't know them I, don't, I know but people call each other peep online hey peeps I don't know what they mean. Someone tell us. <laughs> I okay, fine. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I you know, at some point maybe we should do like a little show where we talk about, you know, like Parasite by Mira Grant or we talk about Peeps by Scott <laughs> Westerfeld and and all these these fun books that I think sort of, I don't know, popularize in a in an interesting way uh Isn't Miller's Sense of Snow isn't that another one that involves uh, parasites? I love that book. Yeah. <laughs> and the movie was terrific. Uh, yeah, tremendous, tremendous. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh -huh. Now, I actually end up with having to pronounce this. Yeah, uh, I think you always end up with this one, don't you? <laughs> well, I, gives I, you usually, no, I usually like Dixon to get this. and then Yeah, we'll but I, I'm not going to do so, it. So, Akarja. Rushed and hopefully not late guest for the last TWIP case. Some of us were presenting at a joint parasitology meeting. Oh, wow. And then we have an acronym soup, ISP. BSPP, BAVP, EVPC in uh, Belgium. And I think a lot of those P's stand for uh, parasite. Or so parasite. British Society of Parasitology, I got that one. And British the International Association Society, for, yeah. for, for, for Veterinary Parasitology, that's the next one. Mm -hmm. And I think the European Veterinary Parasitology Conference is also there. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of parasite yeah. stuff thrown together. Also. So in Belgium, when the last podca podcast came out, of course, getting back from being away, there were lots of larvae to be counted <laughs> and small mammals to be surveyed. But I had a quick ah, yes. listen with parasitology lab mates. Rhymes with Twipper. It's uh -oh. Gwen the Slipper. <laughs> a new excellent visiting student from University of Toulouse, Menan, Dafa, Saraguse. And so you got to give us a little rhyme for that one, too. The difficulty in cleaning themselves after passing stools made us immediately think of Giardia, and we believe none of the drugs she has been given would affect Giardia. The length of the infection seems unusual, but if the water storage is contaminated, perhaps there is a possibility of repeat infections. The long period over which the woman has suffered these symptoms suggests also the possibility of infection with Entamoeba histolytica which may also have contaminated the water storage and can also cause mucousy stools. Similarly, we also do not think the drugs administered would have cured e histolytic infection. Mm. One problem with this line of thinking is everyone else using the water source should also be infected, but they may be asymptomatic. 
On the way to the airport after the parasitology meeting, I mentioned the case study to a friend who may also now become a TWIP devotee. Ah. She, she, she mentioned tri trichomonas, no, a tri parasite. Tri trichomonas. Tri trichomonas. Tri -trichomonas. Thank you. You're tri trichomonas, right. parasite more associated with cattle, right. but with rare opportunistic human infections. Although unlikely due to the rarity of cases, I thought I would bring it up as I found it very interesting, and I am not sure if it has been mentioned on TWIP before. Mm -hmm. She also mentioned the possibility of celiac disease, which would match the symptoms. In reading up more on gluten intolerance, we did read of the possibility of lactose intolerance developing from Giardia infections. So that's another possibility. Mm -hmm. So our next step would be to examine stool for evidence of the presence of the parasites and possibly some allergy tests. If parasites were found, it would also be good to examine where the water is stored to see if it is contaminated. And Salon, Peter Stewart <laughs> at TCB Parasitology. Right. Nice. Very good. Right. William writes, greetings, Twiptologists. As a longtime listener of TWIV while studying as a biology major at the College of William and Mary, I was delighted to latch on to TWIP this year as an outstanding educational resource and way to pass the time during my long commutes. I've had a run of correct guesses the last few episodes, so I figured I may as well throw my hat into the ring for this case differential. As was remarked on the podcast by Dr. De Pommier and Griffin, the symptoms described seem to point to a number of of possible parasitic infections. My first thought was giardiasis with the bloating, steatorrhea, and diffuse abdominal pain, but the likelihood of this continuing unabated for three years without diagnosis seems low to me. Additionally, treatment without bendazole having no effect, listed as an alternative treatment for G. lamblia infections in the sixth edition of PD, seems to make this more unlikely. The lack of albendazole efficacy might not be the ideal way to narrow down the list of possibilities. <laughs> so, so as some infections, such as trichuria, can require multiple doses over time to cure. But as I don't know the course of albendazole treatment given, I'm still going to use it. This would dissuade me from citing hookworm or similar infections generally treatable with albendazole. While trichinella can present in ways that point to a number of possible diseases, I do not think that it fits the bill here. The timeline does not add up according to 6th edition, my main source for all these guesses. The abdominal pain should be closely associated with the early gastrointestinal phase after ingesting infected tissue, and different symptoms would have presented long before now. This extended affliction, as well as the non-watery stool, also seems to rule out something like cryptosporidiosis. Currently, my best guess for the culprit of this infection, given the duration of the noted GI symptoms, would be long-term case of entamoeba histolytica, which if left untreated can persist for months or years. My hesitation with this is the lack of blood in the stool, as untreated infections will often lead to some form of dysentery. I don't think in the podcast there was a specific mention of heme testing of the stool, so maybe it just wasn't immediately apparent. This is my lack of clinical experience showing here. If this is the case, the recommended treatment would be metronidazole, either orally or intravenously. Thanks. For the excellent podcast, this is such a great program for aspiring scientists and health professionals. William, P.S., it's currently 21 degrees Celsius and raining here in Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. Wow, there we have a different guest, don't we? We do. Chris writes, Hello, Twipsters. The symptoms presented by this patient seem to suggest chronic Giardia infections. Steatorrhea and abdominal pain are particularly telling. But the primary water source for this household doesn't seem especially susceptible to contamination, that being rainwater collected on the tin roof. The source of infection would likely be elsewhere. The evidence for this parasite isn't overwhelming, but its sheer ubiquity is enough to warrant some consideration. Molecular diagnosis is preferred because of the intermittent shedding of parasite cysts, which can make them difficult to detect in a single fecal sample. Treatment with metronidazole is common. Right. We've got our list. So let's see. We had one, hmm, two. Oh, so two people suggested entamoeba. Yes. And then we have the remainder giardia. Exactly. Okay. Now, Daniel, <laughs> where do we go from here? Spotlight is back on you. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, before we spotlight me, I like we always like to find out what you guys are thinking and if you have any more questions at this point that might help you. 
Is there anything we didn't include that could sort of help you at this point? Other than the microscopic examination. No, no. we can't have that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think I mentioned that this is, um, you know, here we are in this remote place, so we're going to have to, this is what we're going to get, and we're going to have to decide what to do in this context. Exactly. And I will tell you, I'm going to add this. Um, we have no metronidazole with us. So if you do <laughs> think, so no, if you do think you want to treat with that, you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to send someone um, by boat from the base back to this place. And that's, I think, what did we mention? It's about three hours each way by boat across open water. Wow. Uh, so, wow. so what are you guys, what are you guys thinking? Now, uh, albendazole is a, should be, Take care of Giardia, shouldn't it? Mm. How many doses do you need, and did they As, give enough? I'm not a doctor. Are you a doctor? No, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> he's the doctor. Let's ask Daniel. him. <laughs> well, he's giving us the case, so he might not want to answer. I know, it, but, but the fly- Daniel, if if you were treating Giardia with albendazole, how much would you have to give? Is it one dose enough, or you have to That's give multiple? Question. No, and I, I think the problem you're going to run into is albendazole is is not a great treatment for um, for giardiasis. So it knocks it down, but it doesn't get rid of it. All right, so you guys should put that in the book. No, you know, so we have actually. I should say this. might be there. We are <laughs> we are adding to the. Um, we're adding. We're actually doing a third printing of our textbook. We're actually getting it professionally edited, and in there we actually talk about all the different. Um, um, actual treatments. There's a whole clinical appendix in this new printing, Good. and we'll also don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna add that to the PDF, and you can post that for us, Vincent. Okay, right. Um, but yeah, That's, so we'll talk about that. So I, really, you know, I, I lean towards Giardia. Also, I think it's a reasonable diagnosis. I don't think it's um, something like strongyloides because I think eventually, eventually, you will start to develop bacteremias, and you will start to suffer greatly for that infection. But it can be chronic. I mean, I know that, for instance, they had a lot of uh, troops that returned from the Second World War that had GR- that had strongyloides as a chronic infection that after they turned 75 or 80 mm-hmm. began to really cause serious clinical problems. I see. So it, it could smolder for that long. And this, this sure. could be um, strongyloides. That's my other guess that uh, it's either GRD or strongyloides. But I think the, the evidence... You know, can can uh, entamoeba cause steatorrhea? Uh, no, not really. It, it what it can do is it, it can induce something called an amoeboma, which then mm-hmm. blocks the passage of stool down the um, the large intestine. And uh, if you have superimposed on top of that a, a strongyloides infection, which is very possible, then that can become hyperinfectious as the result of the slowing down of the passage of the stages that should go out as a second stage larva, could but could develop to a third stage larva within the patient itself. So, so those are rare occasions, and you have to think about these things because these people exist at a very very uh, low level of sanitation, and both of these things are possible. And maybe she's got both of those things, all right? Yeah, I wouldn't eliminate the possibility of of two diagnoses rather than just one. Mm-hmm. No, I, I actually I like I like the fact that you went there with that discussion and the um, because when you're in a situation like this and you're trying to make the diagnosis, um, you know the the person wrote in, uh, did you do any heme testing on the stool? Because I think <laughs> as we've mentioned, is you don't always see gross blood mixed in with the stool, right. but if you do heme testing. Um, it's close to 100% that, that people with um, amoebic dysentery or in the intestinal infection right. with amoeba That's will right. have detectable heme in the, in the stool. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there still tends to be watery, not greasy. They tend to, you know, it's, it's more of a mm. colonic, right? You're not getting this small That's veli right. intestinal um, it's a impact. secretory it's diarrhea right. rather than a malabsorption. That's exactly, exactly. Right. So That's that, exactly that, right. that I think is helpful here. Right. Um, people might make the point that, you know what, you're going to treat her with um, a week or so of your metronidazole, which is going to treat both, right? Um, because if you, you have that drug. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that might be a missing drug in your arsenal as well because of, uh, I don't know, is it? So you, so you like you like Giardia. Uh, yeah. What about you, Vincent? Should I? I like Giardia because of the steatorrhea, right? And I think the water is the water source that she's using to drink is consistent. But strongyloides can give you steatorrhea also. Can? Yep. Well, I looked it up. Malab- and it wasn't on the list. But well, I malab- believe you. I no, believe you. It's malabsorption. Yeah, yeah. That's, sure. that's basically what it is. 
I'm going with uh, Giardia. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with Vincent. Yeah, I mean, so I will say that was that was our impression in this case that that was the most likely, and also going through what people had tried in the past. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so, and there were two issues here. One was we wanted to do a therapeutic trial of something to see if we could affect a cure. Um, we also needed to figure out a time when we could um, meet her husband. Right. So, so we actually, um, some of the volunteers, some of the people, um, actually one of the medical directors that following Friday went back by boat, you know, three hours open water, mm. um, crack of dawn, got there early in the morning before the husband went off to work in the fields and, um, was able to give her a supply of the, um, of the metronidazole. And also was able to explain to the husband, um, you know, we're trying to treat this and, you know, and, and your wife, this is expected. Um, don't interpret this the wrong way. And then a, a really nice thing is they actually keep medical records. So when they go back to mm. this village, they're going to be able to check in with this woman and we're going to be able to find, did this therapeutic trial have impact? Um, which isn't maybe as ideal as being able to do an on-the-spot test, but maybe we can get a little bit into some of people's comments here. And so I, I will comment first off. I thought it was nice the way the person in what was it, David wrote us, talking about how this Giardia can end up in the uh, roof water runoff um, that gets contaminated, and and maybe people need to sort of picture these villages, right? It's it's not um, it's not a clean pure roof that is collecting our nice water the you know there's trees hanging over this there's animals running off and on uh, i think i've described the kids are bouncing balls off the roof and you know that that dirt from the ground that they're walking barefoot in that you know is now on that ball and being bounced into the drinking water they have primates all over the place too non-human yes. primates so they go all over the place and yeah there's howler monkeys which is amazing i love exactly. howler monkeys exactly. scree- screaming at you from the trees <laughs> exactly. howling so to speak yep um, there's the, uh, the sloths, right? The sloths are all moving around. Fortunately, oh, wow. you have to worry about every eight days, right? Otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But dogs can be a, a reservoir for Giardia as well. Unfortunately. And also yeah. for strongyloides too. But Yeah, and the dogs are not using the over-the-water toilets. They might be yeah. somewhere where the ball is being bounced before yeah, exactly it exactly right, exactly right. So, yeah, so there, there's clearly, and, and I think it was also someone mentioned um, the the IgG positivity is, Giardia is super common. It's, you know, I think 40% in some of these studies in areas of Panama, and I would say right. some of these islands higher, actually. Um, but the interesting thing that came up, why isn't everybody sick? Why does and everybody have steatorrhea, and then it, it only turns out there's only a few percent of people that will end up with um, these chronic symptoms. Um, mm. It's a, it's an immune difference, I think. You didn't mention her weight. Do you think she was normal for her weight? She actually was. Yeah, she was not. Um, I mean, she was eating, I guess, to compensate for the, whatever the loss was. That's interesting because there's usually weight loss associated with giardia as well. Yeah, and flatulence. Partic- these fellows particularly in still. children, right? Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. Major. Exactly right. And someone else brought up the um, the lactose intolerance, and this is the thing I, I feel mm-hmm. bad because every so often this happens is is somebody goes somewhere and they're treated or they live somewhere and they get treated, and now you've treated the infection and they think oh I'm all better and they go back to eating right away, but particularly Giardia, because the the lactose, the enzyme that digests milk, is at the very tip of the villi. It's going to take a few weeks before they really can handle a good milk load. I'll say. And so they go and they think like, oh, this is great. I'm so much better. And then they have a big glass of maybe skim milk because they're a healthy person, they think. And next thing you know, they're they're bent over cramping and, and they hate they hate you. And so, That's right. So, they don't pay their bills. You get behind on your boat payments and, you know, it's a big mess. Yeah. <laughs> it's we'll called the it. domino effect, I believe. But no, I'll say your, your job's not done as a doctor just giving them the metronidus. All you also have to do a little like, okay, yeah. I'm going to treat this, That's but right. now we're going to have to ease you back into your diet and you know yeah, well <laughs> she's got a lot on her plate though because she's got like the other person said two young children a husband that's feeling disaffected uh she doesn't feel well herself she's been told that she might need surgery is you know that's, that's a that's a panic situation for most people they they um they may not take your advice on all levels and it's difficult because you're only going to be there for a while right and then you're going to be gone and uh so you treat her and maybe she gets better, but if you don't know what her habits are, it's possible that she'll just reacquire it. 
No, I mean, that, that's a, one of the great things I'll say about organizations like Floating Doctors is the commitment to going back. Uh, people mm. brought up the, the risks of unnecessary surgery. And sometimes um, with medical missionary work where people sort of go in to, to do some good and then they're gone and there's no follow-up, you can, particularly if you're doing a surgical intervention, things like that, you, you need follow-up for these things. You need yeah. to make sure what you're doing is working. Oh, you're right. A, you're right. It's just, it's, I, I think that's why I'm attracted to organizations like Floating Doctors, like Femeric, things like that, where, there, where there's a commitment, an ongoing commitment. And it may not be the same person, but the organization makes sure that there's an ongoing continuity right. of assistance. Is there any effort then, uh, Daniel, as you mentioned, the difficulty of getting these drugs sometimes and to have a, a pharmacy, maybe a stash of drugs that are kept in that place that don't have expiration dates that you're worried about um, – so that you can treat a number of different things like, for instance, salmonella, which would be a life-threatening uh, disease. Yeah. No. Um, so what, what you bring up is really important. And um, starting not too far back, um, Ben Lebrat started an organization, um, Remote um, Education, which actually I'm part of. And what they do is they try to teach the whole process of putting together a pharmacy. So when you go to one of these areas, and I think what happened is when we went to this um, village this time, we were actually overwhelmed by the number of people that came. So sort of overwhelmed by the success, which is why we actually ran out of All such right. a critical drug. Now, we didn't run out of it as much as we had not brought enough with us. And then, you know, that's sort of the way they plan is that if you run out of something, they're going to bring people back like a, a sort of a day at the end of the week. Okay. And then, come with the needed supplies but that's but you still do you still do need to um uh i'll say respect expiration dates um you don't want to be giving out um, expired medicine sort of the idea that oh this is a lower quality of care and it's okay and and the, sure. the, the response is no you need to make sure that the medicines you're giving are efficacious and are not expired and right. um and then making sure you have the chain so yeah when you go to these places you have the medicines or you have the ability to get them um uh, to those people all right. Well, that's a big that's a big challenge. So then, okay, what did you do? <laughs> so we gave her a week of flagell, <laughs> right? A week of uh, metronidazole, metronidazole right. and uh, we'll see. We'll see how she does, hmm. and um, they'll be back for follow up. So it'll be interesting to see how she does. Right. And Speaking of expiration dates, I had a conversation with my wife, who has worked in pharma all her career. Yes. And she said the expiration date is a reflection of how far out the company has tested yeah. the product. It may, in fact, last longer, but they haven't gone beyond that, so they don't mark it. Right. So you could, same with food, you could could exactly. be okay, but exactly. you know they have only, we only went out one year, and that's as far as we're going to tell you it's good. Right. So you really can't take your chances because you don't know. Got it. But it could last another year or two years. It depends on a lot of things, conditions, right? They can't test every temperature either. No. Right? No, of course not. A little knowledge is fascinating, and a lot of knowledge is amazing. <laughs> the other thing is that they can't test all the age groups and all the um, the subtypes of people that are out there, like non-secretors for IgA yeah, or course, celiac patients. They can't do that, and nope. so these are um, restricted recommendations. All right, we had seven guesses. We're going to give away a book, right? Great. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, I was going to wait before you do that. I oh, we had to tell to say. you. Oh, you have more, I have to, more say. to say. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Lots more to say. I wanted, there really is a lot to say here, but I one of our emailers brought up the issue here of, um, I guess we'll call it point of care diagnostics. So they were talking about the um, mm -hmm. the smartphone-based microscopy. And um, I mean, we could probably talk a whole episode, so I'll try not to overdo this. But um, this is one of the great things is that I, I always make a point of how challenging it is without the self-correction of a lab to be practicing medicine. Mm. And so there's been a, a growing number of point of care diagnostics. And so actually, in, there was an article in Nature just the last few months here where the um, this group actually – publish sort of a free share 3D printer file that you can create a microscope that pops onto the end of your smartphone. I love it. And wow. then you slide the slide in, you know, and, you know, the, no one's making any money. This is try to get it out there so people can use it. Nice. And it's amazing the resolution that this little um, adapter, this sort of free shareware 3D printer <laughs> uh, 
can produce for you. So there's um, there's this smartphone-based microscope that's developed at UC Berkeley. Uh, there's also um, using smartphones, we, we talked about the dermoscope, but also mm-hmm. to do eye exams with a panoptic where you mount a Welch Allen device on the end of your smartphone and get these beautiful pictures of the back of the eye, use them for diabetic um, monitoring and screening. Um, and there's even soon coming to market is an ultrasound that plugs into your smartphone. It's actually mm-hmm. iPhone that plugs in and you've got your probe and you're actually using the iPhone as your screen. Amazing. And so, That's I mean, great. it's amazing, this technology, because it makes a huge difference. I mean, we were at the retrovi- ri- retrovirology conference yesterday, right? We were. And with HIV, um, it's so critical at point of care to be able to get CD4 counts, things like this, where it really helps you manage um, where it's often difficult for a follow-up. So it's so key to be able to get the, these answers right at the time so you can provide the therapy. So a lot of science fiction data have actually become part of our world. And I'm reminded of the fact that the tricorder of, uh, of old and, uh, you know, bones with his, uh, I forget what that was called. Actually, there was a name for it, but uh, it's scanner. It's a yeah, non-invasive scanner, basically that actually does the diagnostics. There was a tricorder. Is this the tricorder? Is this different? No, maybe the tricorder was uh, Star Trek. That's right. Yeah, that's right, Star Trek. So they're working on one. As I, I heard someone mention somewhere. To oh me yeah, that I was for at. sure. They're working on totally. It. And that it's not out of the question. What an imagination that guy Rodden. We had. will have amazing things. Yeah, that's right. You know what? Amazing. Things are happening here. <laughs> That's our motto. No, there, you know, so there was, I, I, I can't not share this one. So there was a recent, they, they realized that people with tuberculosis have a different spectral, I guess I'll say smell. So it was the ability to diagnose tuberculosis, uh, pulmonary yeah. tuberculosis, yep. based upon basically the odors of That's their right. breath. That's mm-hmm. And so the idea here is you'll, and it's pretty impressive, I was reading mm-hmm. this article, mm-hmm. pretty impressive that you'll be, instead of like a breath analyzer, did you drink too much? It'll be a breath analyzer. Do you have right. pulmonary TB? I mean, right. amazing. Right. So, so. <clears throat> while we were in Hamilton, Montana, was that last year? Yeah, it's it was last summer. <laughs> we heard about a, uh, a while we were there it had nothing to do with the meeting we were at but we heard that there was a group of um, biologists looking at stream ecology problems oh, yeah, yeah. that were measuring the dna yeah. content of the water with regards to the kinds of aquatic insects that are present in the water mm-hmm. and they could tell when the hatch times would come based on the increase in the rise of DNA of a certain kind of like caddisflies or mayflies. Totally. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because the recent headline in one of the stories that I've been reading. Oh, the Loch Ness Monster. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> They're going to go looking in the Loch Ness for, <laughs> for the DNA signature of the Loch Ness Monster. And I just hope they find it, which is going to be a, a large inflatable uh, well, you know, a swimming pool toy that some kid uh, is playing a trick on How do on they know with. what the Loch Ness signature is? <laughs> they don't. Of course they don't. <laughs> I mean, they're going to find something that's not they in the don't. database, and that's not surprising because they don't have everything. In the, <laughs> they have no idea anyway. what they're looking for. That's right. How would you develop a probe for that? The answer yeah. is you don't know. Well, what you have to do is you have to do, <laughs> you have to do total sequencing. You filter out the stuff you don't recognize. Right. And then you have what's left, and then who knows what it is? could be anything. See that? There's a skeptic. I agree with the skeptic to my So mind. I think this, this Loch Ness is baloney. Don't waste your time. Of course time. it's baloney, but... Go have lunch. Baloney lasts a long time sometimes. It has a long shelf life, unfortunately. Baloney is a mishmash of... Stuff. Oh, you don't want to know what baloney is. It's just... A, it's what's left. Right. Anything <laughs> right. else, Daniel? Daniel, did, oh, I, I, any I feedback as to how she's doing? No, she's um, so no, we'll, we'll find out though, right? So this was March, so we're going to find out actually next month. I will check in and see how she's doing. And um, I guess we've always said we'll, we would just make sure we do a little recap of the life cycle of the pathogen. So you want to do that for us, Dixon? How, uh, how does one get GRD? This is too simple. You know, there's, this, <laughs> there's an environmentally resistant stage. It's four, It's got four nuclei inside, and it's got a little acellular wall around it, which protects it from all kinds of environmental disturbances like high temperatures or low pHs or things of the sort. And um, it's transmitted usually by water, mm-hmm. by contaminated water, fecally contaminated water, but also by food handlers, you know, fecally contaminated food items. Uh, you ingest the cyst. The cyst then uh, undergoes uh, morphogenesis in the small intestine when it receives the right environmental cues to allow two organisms to come out of each cyst 
they're binucleate. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also stressed the fact that these nuclei are both transcriptionally active, which is interesting because Giardix is, is considered one of the oldest uh, protozoan that we know of. If you go back in time using the uh, 16 sRNAs and the 18 sRNAs to, or yeah, that's right. I think that's right. Ribosomes. I meant to say ribosomes. You can, you can see how long ago in evolutionary history you can find the remnants of these sequences. And mm -hmm. Giardia goes back as far as they can go. So that's very interesting because imagine a primitive organism having two nuclei. And I thought that would have been an addition yeah. Not a subtraction. Yeah. But the, so then the trophozoites, there are two, persists. I have these little uh, concave uh, areas of their bodies, which allows them to sort of suction cup their way onto the villi. And that's where they stay and divide. And, and if enough of them divide and cover the villi, that's where the malabsorption comes in. And um, we don't know what they eat. Uh, we have no idea about their met metabolism. We know that they're facultative anaerobes. Uh, they will survive in oxygen, but they will not grow. They're they're actually anaerobes, and that's why metronidazole has an effect on them because that's an effective antimicrobial that it, it only infects affects rather um, anaerobes. And eventually, with enough uh, trophozoite stages, they get the idea maybe we should exit the host. So some of them start to round up and form cysts. The nuclei divide, sequesters all the stuff inside into special organelles, which we want describe and out they go into the large intestine into the stool into the environment and that completes the cycle and this was one of the first protozoans ever seen under the microscope because Leuvenhoek actually Leuven. saw, yes. saw yes. his own stool so he described <laughs> the trophozoites as little fluttering Did leaf like he have a chronic infection he, uh, asymptomatic no doubt well who knows who knows didn't you ask him I did actually. He never responded to my letters. I was really put <laughs> off. Should have emailed them. I did. I tried everything, but it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. I even set up a meeting with him once. Some people are impossible. <laughs> right? They are. They are. All he wanted to do was drink Amstel Light. He also lo looked at his <laughs> sperm. You know. <laughs> he looked at everything. He looked at rainwater. He looked at paint. He looked at everything. Blood. Everything. Paint. Yeah, everything. They had paint the, oh, they yeah, were they were, they they were little <laughs> microscope societies that used to meet once, in, uh, like a book club. And they used to compare what they've seen and make little drawings and stuff. It was quite a wonderful area area to be alive in. It's pretty they, good now. It had to be in a drop. It had to be. Yeah, it was sort so of. It was a hot. hanging it drop. A, yeah, hanging it was a drop. hanging drop microscope. Yeah. That's right. And it still. I mean, it still works. Yeah, they have it. It's. Uh, it's in light. Where? Leiden. There's a museum in Leiden, and there it no, is. No, it wasn't a good time to be alive because you would die by the time you were 35 <laughs> of infectious disease, right? You could. There's no doubt about the fact that, that a lot of people died at an early I mean, yeah, age. some people did get lucky and live longer. But You're right. You're yeah, right. So, you know, the average lifespan was not very long. Yeah. So uh, there are multiple species of Giardia, and so you used to call it Giardia lamblia because Lamble and, um, yeah, Lamble was the one who described mm -hmm. the cysts. And then... Um, the names have undergone changes based on the fact that there are multiple hosts for the Giardia genera, dogs, cats, uh, mm -hmm. monkeys, etc. So, so intestinalis has been used as the common more uh, human form of uh, Giardia today. But uh, everybody still refers to it as Giardia lamblia, I think. I think the old term is just as good as the others. There's no confusion about what it is and how it works. And, uh, so. and it's, uh, when you go out camping, there's a term for it. It's called beaver fever. That's right. Because you, you can get it from beavers? Yeah, that's you right. You drink water from the stream. That you the think beaver, it's pristine, but you know. The beaver has defecated in the Yeah, stream. you bet. You bet. Well, you they bet. should. It's their outhouse, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. It's their outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's their outhouse. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Right. So illuminating this from the environment is almost impossible. That's the point. Of course. So good sanitation is probably the only way to do it. We do have outbreaks in this country, though. We have outbreaks in daycare centers and all kinds of situations. So uh, it's one of those things that we just live with. And people that don't secrete IgA do even worse than people yes. that, don't, that do secrete IgA. And by the way, Vincent, just as an aside, mm -hmm. did you read recently where there's a, there's a microbiome um, – microbe which we absolutely need which depends upon it being linked to iga to attach itself to the small intestine I saw that yeah which then eliminates the pathogens that might also take up residence so that there. someone sent it to us on twim yeah that's fantastic mm -hmm. I think. you know it's a good time to be alive it's a good time to be alive <laughs> exactly 
We're learning so much in a very short period of time. Anything else, Daniel? No, I think that's great. Right. Oh, by the way, do you know of any resistant forms of Giardia to the drug? So I think we talked about that on a prior one. I had a I had a patient who um, actually had resistance, and we did finally cure him of Giardia, and he's much better. But now he has this sort of post-inflammatory um, irritable oh, bowel, dear. which is interesting. We're starting to appreciate that a lot of times when people get um, an infection after they travel, they come back, they get better, but they never get all the way better, and then they can develop a post-infectious irritable bowel. And so right. um, I was actually communicating with him just this week about that that um so if this woman doesn't get better and she still had giardia this could be a resistant form yeah no that's and that's the challenge i think i was pointed out some of them are becoming resistant so so the next drug i think vincent you brought this up like what if you don't have your metronidazole is you can do a uh, nitazoxamide mm -hmm. um, for okay. a three-day course and so that's that's another um and there are some other we we'll actually in our clinical clinical appendix which we should probably just get up on the website for people to access. Um, it goes through some of the different um, alternative drugs. Right. Not straightforward in some cases, though. That's the problem. And, right. and I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, I wanted to add something else. Go that ahead. The, the older work of uh, uh, Richard Deckelbaum, um, who was a friend of mine and worked in Israel for a long time, uh, noticed differences between carrier states and people suffering from the infection itself, especially in small children, um, if you're if you have symptomatic giardiasis, you lose weight. If you have asymptomatic giardiasis, apparently you don't lose weight. And if you're a carrier for a long term carrier, these people apparently gain weight hmm. and seem to be thriving a lot better than the two other groups that I just mentioned. And that's a remarkable evolutionary uh, strategy for this parasite, if that's true. Because here, they, the ones that actually are in the position of transmitting this to most people are the carriers. And yeah. if the carrier state of this, of this infection creates a, um, a more resilient human host, mm -hmm. then the chances of it being spread are much greater. And so that there would be a selection for that in nature. And, right. I, and I think that's a remarkable connection that uh, I haven't heard to the contrary. So I think that that still holds up. The data are still pretty strong for that. Yeah, so I just brought up here our clinical appendix, what we say about Giardia for treatment. Um, and I recently reviewed, um, so as we mentioned, the, the drug of choice is metronidazole. That's three times a day for um, a week. Now, we often do 500 three times a day, and I think we just, we've gotten used to that as a dose, but 250 is probably fine. And the tinidazole, two gram, one dose. Right. And then the nidazoxamide, that's a BID for three days of 500 milligrams. But then the alternatives are Peroma mycin, um, ferazolidone, quinacrine, and then um, the albendazole. That's an old drug, right? Yeah. And the albendazole is is a week, so four hundred a day for right. a week. But right. but these are actually you know these are sort of in alternative inferior to the metronidazole. But maybe as we're seeing resistance, um, they you know it's not inferior if no. the if the. Giardia is resistant to your metronidazole. And I, isn't there a history? Weren't you one of the first people involved in Giardia resistance, Dixon? No, is it, am I, am is I that, confusing you with someone else? No, you're not confusing me. <laughs> you're confusing the organism. It was actually Trichomonas. It oh, wasn't Trichomonas, Giardia, yeah. Okay. Not Giardia, but it was yeah. an, another and anaerobe. It was a, yeah, and it was, a, yeah. You know, and so a good friend of mine, Miklos Mueller, working at uh, Rockefeller, uh, I, I put him in touch with the uh, <laughs> admitting attendant, uh, Wayne Miller, who actually got that case and couldn't cure this woman of her trichomoniasis, and she turned out to have the first case of, of metronidazole-resistant trichomonas. Mm -hmm. These are just little bon moths that we throw at each other during the course <laughs> of this. <laughs> bon All right, let's give away a book. You got it. We had seven people. The random number between one and seven is... <laughs> Number one. How about that? Ta-da! Number one would What's be... What's the chance of that? So David well, P. I think David P. is already... It's one in seven, actually. <laughs> David P. has won a book. Excellent. So David P., tell us what you want us to do with your book. Right. Um, give it to one of the other people, but we'll take it... You tell us, okay? Twip at microbe.tv. Exactly. 
Oh, did David P. win a book before? I'm so pretty he, sure uh, he did, yeah. Second time winner. I'm okay. pretty sure. If my memory is faulty, that's fine. You just tell me, David P., but well. I do seem to remember sending one. But if I'm wrong, we'll send it to you, David Some P. Some people us know. are just lucky. David P. was uh, is always or usually the first with the guess. You know, well, maybe there's some merit to that then. You deserve two books if you're. Well, you that, don't need two, but he could give one away, <laughs> he or probably know someone who could needs this. Book. Tell us who to give to, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. we will do that. Okay, now the next part. of yes. Twip is some journal science, Dixon, and that today Dixon has an interesting selection of papers. Well, yes, and the reason why I picked these two papers is because I'm I was quite familiar with the results of the first paper because it came out at a time when I was still active in research. 1967. Yep. You were doing research then? Oh, you bet. You wow, bet. you're I, an old guy, aren't I you? I am. I had just graduated from uh, my PhD program, and I took up uh, residence as a postdoc at Rockefeller. That was the first year I was there. And uh, I was part of the New York Society for Tropical Medicine, which <laughs> met at various places, but mostly at Cornell. And this result was discussed at one of those meetings that I attended. And what is this result? Okay, the result, the paper's title is Protective Immunity produced by the injection of X-radiated sporozoites of Plasmodium burgii, which is a a malaria of mice. And this was by a group at uh, NYU, and uh, Daniel uh, received his MD degree there and knew some of these people, I think. And uh, the authors are, as soon as this comes up on my screen, uh, Ruth Nussenzweig, Harry Most, (laughs) <laughs> Jerry Vanderberg and one other name, which I'm C. Orton. I I don't know who that is, to be honest. And perhaps they're giving credit to somebody who raised the mosquitoes because it was very important in this study to have live mosquitoes with the stage that is transmitted via the bite, rather. What than would that be called? The sporozoite. It's the sporozoite. Sporozoite. That's correct. Was so, he a radiologist by chance, Orton? It, maybe, maybe he was. It, and maybe he was the one who irradiated the sporozoites, and that's why that's, they put him on. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But it could be. I, I don't know, but uh, I do know what the results are. Okay, the results are quite astounding. Right, so you you have to pull out the sporozoites from the mosquito. How do you do this? You, well, you do that under a dissection microscope, and you pull off the head of the mosquito <gasps> and the salivary glands. Only the females, by the way, and the salivary glands come out in there, and you do this in. Um, phosphate buffered saline or something of this Mm -hmm. sort and the sporozoites are inside the salivary glands okay and you then pull the salivary glands out of the head of the mosquito right you can isolate lots of salivary glands this way i mean as we Mm -hmm. get to the next paper you'll see that that's even more laborious but they did it and they ended up with a large culture dish filled with salivary glands then you macerate that mass of uh, material and out come the sporozoites, and then you can sort of separate them by segregation. Mm-hmm. Then you concentrate them, and then, of course, what they wanted to do was to prove that this was a uh, an epitope-containing stage which would induce protection. Now, Dixon, um, how many sporozoites would you have in a single salivary gland from one mosquito? Yeah, well, it depends on how many oocysts the mosquito has on its stomach wall. That's the determining mm. factor because that's where the sporozoites are produced. More than one. Oh, thousands, 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 thousands per mosquito. Absolutely. If they're heavily infected with oocysts, they've got tons. So the idea being, if you can <clears throat> immunize people with a sporozoite, that's what you get infected with. And then if you have an antibody response against right. that, it might block infection. That's right. correct. Or or some other immune mechanism. By right. Because they right. worked on lots of cell-mediated immune sure. response. Too. The point is that this, is, this would produce a sterile immunity. Okay. If you could block the penetration of this stage into the hepatocytes. Now, this is P. Burgi. P. Burgi. Why did they pick that strain? It was convenient. Uh, it's a model for human malaria. It, might, it affects mice, right? Yeah. Exactly right, and they and the mosquito vector Anopheles stevens is the one that it's easy to raise in the lab. So they had the life cycle going in the laboratory, and by the way, no danger of transmitting this to people. So in case some of the mosquitoes got loose, and they mm-hmm. do occasionally, and by people, there's no risk in, in, no, at all. All right, because uh, despite John O'Hara's, I believe that's the author of Mice and Men. Uh, <laughs> mice are not men, and men are not mice. But you can create a mouse that looks like a human, as we'll see in the next paper. Um, but the point is what they discovered was that without um, the ability to inject 
semi-live, I will use that term, or attenuated sporozoids. Like half dead? Half, <laughs> you know, I don't know what it means. Because when you attenuate a virus, uh, you're probably talking about the number of, of, of the ability of that virus to get inside of a cell. Or its ability to replicate it once it gets inside. There's there's an attenuation of it. Well, it's still it's still replicating, but it right? still replicates yeah. at a rate which the immune system can keep up with. Is that the same idea here? I no, it's not the same idea here because this is not going to replicate. So they irradiate them with well, no, no. The, the right? first thing they did was just kill them with and well, heating or freezing, All right. and then injecting those into mice, you get partial immunity, but you don't get a it's not, full It's not 100%. It's protected. not a sterile immunity. Okay. You get a reduction in the parasite load, but you don't get an elimination of the parasite. Mm-hmm. So then they started to think, well, maybe they have to be attenuated. So they started to use radiation, as and, and also ultraviolet radiation in addition to x-rays. And they came up with a, a, a range of RADs that between eight a range and, of rads, yeah, like a that. range of rads. Uh, I guess I like it was that. kilorads of eight to ten kilorads of of radiation on these sporozoites was enough to attenuate them enough to induce maximum levels of sterilizing immunity. It was a remarkable result. This was sterilizing. Yes, they would give them like a anywhere for like a seventy five thousand irradiated uh, attenuated sporozoites, and then follow that up with a a thousand live non attenuated. Uh, of sporozoites and the mis- and the mice were totally immune to but this. But not every mouse. Not every mouse, but but, but the ones uh, who were protected didn't get were, any. That's, they said they had a thirty seven percent infection yeah, rate right. in that group, but they had ninety percent if they didn't do that. Okay, All right. And the protected ones, they did not become infected. That's correct. Yeah, the the thirty seven percent were. It either worked or it didn't work. That's the point. It didn't work partially. It worked all the way, or it didn't work. How would you t- look in a mouse to see if it were infected? What, what kind of you Just look in the blood. You take some blood and sure. look, put it on a microscope, of course, right? That's correct. Mm-hmm. Now, now, they also mentioned the fact that they tried to make a vaccine using blood stages of the parasite, and they had very poor success with that. And so they had to go back in time and look to see what the earliest stage of infection was. And of course, it's the. This is the away. one that goes in the red blood cell, right? No. This is the one that goes in the hepatocyte. Hepatocyte, right. Got it. Correct. So then once they got this exciting result, then they started to look at what the epitopes might be that were responsible Mm -hmm. for this, right? And they discovered something remarkable, and that that they actually had the gene for this. After this paper, right? That's right. Yeah. I think now we have to move on to the next paper, right? But, But they knew what the epitope was in this paper. It was a repeated amino acid. Okay, it was a it was a four peptide amino acid repeat, and it had like thirty or forty repeats in this particular protein. Did they in this first paper? I'm looking for that. Uh, they, Maybe they, not in the first no, paper, but in, the in, paper. in, in they, subsequent papers that use this as their only result. Yeah. Yes, yeah. They discovered right. what the epitope was, and it turned out to be a repeated a peptide of four amino acids. It's not and, the six histidine repeat. No, no, no. That's, that's something different. There was no histidine in these at all. There was uh, there was. N for N. Come on, help me out here because I'm losing my abbreviation knowledge of of amino acids. What does N stand for? N A N. So N A N P repeats. Yes, right. Asparagine. Yes. N is asparagine. Oh, okay, fine. Alanine. Alanine. Asparagine. asparagine proline. Uh, proline. What is this? And what this, am I thinking about the histidine repeat protein? No, that, that that's from Plasmodium falciparum. The knobs that develop on the inside okay. of the red cell. That's different. That's different. Okay. So this this repeat. They thought they had found the Holy Grail. Right. And they blasted their way through this data, and they tried and tried and tried to manufacture um, a recombinant version of this Mm -hmm. epitope. Right, right. And they, they... they had partial success every time they tried it. They said, but it can't be anything else because that's all that's there. What else can there be? Okay. And this was sort of at the cusp of monoclonal antibody work. So they weren't really involved in that to begin with. And uh, then as as progression, notice the difference in the time between these two papers. That's the point I was on. The other paper is contemporary. It's this year. Now, let me ask you, a few years ago on TWIP, yes. we did another a paper where they took mosquitoes <laughs> and pulled out spores. Heroic away. numbers That's of lots. mosquitoes. And they, they did a huge trial in that, people, right? That's correct. And it worked. So they had never done that after this first. It was only in mice, and then that that one just a few years ago. Because they got desperate. Because over the course of time, 
we have eliminated, just like I'm afraid to say this, but for the HIV story as well, they've eliminated all of the common solutions that they mm-hmm. thought would be possible. And so they've got, they had to go back to this original finding and say, if it's in the spores of white, damn it, we're going to find it. Damn it, Janet. That's right. Damn it, Jim. <laughs> I'm sure, they, I'm just I'm sure they did not say damn it. I'm sure they used only proper. <laughs> if they said damn it, they said it in Brazilian because they were both from Brazil. So, so now you've got this other group that's going to hang their hat on their result and say, look, if they found irradiated sporozoites from mosquitoes and, and that preparation protected mice against this infection, there can't be that much difference between the humans and the mouse. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to make the Plasmodium burgii look just like the human by doing a transfection and changing the genome of Plasmodium burgii using Plasmodium falciparum sequences. Which ones? Uh, the the repeated four units. The circumsporozoite protein. That's right. That's correct. But it's a little different in Plasmodium falciparum right. than it. it is in Plasmodium burgii. So yeah. they they've got a mouse model where they can actually look at. So they, response. they actually humanized the livers they of did. mice, They right? did, they did. They would have an in vitro system also. And so then they take this. So the protein that is the one on the sporozoite that you've yeah. been yeah. is the circumsporozoite, which means it's around the sporozoite. Yeah, correct. Right. It's on the surface of the sporozoite, basically. It's on the surface. It's a surface protein, just like it's a capsid protein for viruses. It's exactly right. the same concept. And it's dominant. I mean, the whole surface is covered with it. What else can it be, right? So all the monoclonal mm-hmm. antibodies that they've ever had binded to those epitopes, okay? They never had a different epitope to deal with. They always dealt with these epitopes. And so the, they they decided to do something even more different. And that so is, I was I was entertained there, Dixon, that you were you were simplifying this by comparing it to viruses. So all our viewers will. I'm trying to get my <laughs> head around better, this myself better, because better you know I, I sort of live in two worlds, but I live mostly in this one. <laughs> so okay. if I were, I mean, I'm thinking like them now, and so they say, well, what else do we need to to do proof of concept? And so we need an antibody that reacts against an epitope that prevents this stage of the infection from succeeding. And so they've got an in vitro system now. They've got a, a, a clone of hepatocytes. They've got the sporozoites that have been genetically altered from Plasmodium burgii, so making them easy to get. You don't have to raise up mosquitoes that might infect you and give you malaria. You can still work with this in the lab, and you can, mm-hmm. and, but you can do the experiments that are relevant to human infections now, which is remarkable. It's a fantastic new world out there because basically you didn't have any good animal models for human malaria until you could do these things, right? And transfect and that sort of thing. So all that has come about in the last 20 years. That's why this took so long to come to to the forefront. This was a progression of data that eventually, when it all came together, resulted in the discovery of a new epitope. That was the surprise. Now the, the thing here, Dixon, is that monoclonal antibodies were developed a long time ago. Caesar Milstein. And, and they've made, guy they have made a lot of right. monoclonals against this protein over the years. But true. the key here... They didn't make the monoclonals. They got the cell that was making a yeah, single... So that's the key, and that's a recently developed... That's fabulous. ...get people who I love have been it. immunized yeah, that's right, with that's this right. circumsporozoite vaccine. <laughs> exactly. Whole sporozoite vaccine. Yeah, you're, you're the same one that we're talking irradiated. about. Irradiated. You get people, then you take from them B cells... I've, the, well, they took um, B- plasma yeah. blasts, right? B cells, yeah, sure, 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 plasma sure. cells. Yeah, that's right. Um, and no, these but, they are, did, but they did both. Uh, and they took T both. cell memory cells. Right. They took T memory cells. Memory B cells memory B and cell. plasma blasts are two different. Exactly. But and they now screened. You can pull out. You, they did it. The antibody genes. And they got like as you, nine or ten of them. As long as you can. And the same thing has been done with many other infectious agents, notably HIV. There you go. Because we learned that you can make lots of monoclonals against HIV, but the virus will change to evade them. (laughs) So they said, can we find a conserved epitope? There you go. And they found rare, in people, rare B cells that produce broadly neutralizing monoclonals against HIV. I mean, I learned last night at that meeting that there are 16% of the population of the world that has that. That's what has has uh, the inability to become infected. Well, that's for another reason. Oh, okay, that's because they lack a, a co-receptor. Oh, okay, fine. But you can get broadly neutralizing antibodies. But the the whole technology of pulling memory B cells or plasma blasts out of people, cloning out 
and and identifying the ones you want because they have the antibody on the surface, and and cloning out the antibody genes and reconstructing them and making the antibody. It's just amazing. It is. I, I would agree. And has finally come to parasitology. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. So, so a nice historical thing I'll, I'll throw in here, right, yeah. is, is who was the first author that you mentioned on that very old article from 1967? Ruth, Ruth, Ruth Nussensweck. That's correct. So one so of she, the leaders in developing this technology of actually amplifying the light and heavy chain and creating these recombinant... Um, Antibodies was actually her son, Michelle. Yeah. How about right. that? Who's at, at Rockefeller? Rockefeller? Who's at Rockefeller? Yeah. Right. So what? actually, yeah, when we were doing some of this stuff, wow. um, we actually sent someone from the lab um, and they went and trained under him to uh, basically become proficient in that technology. So now you're seeing the son That's of fantastic. Ruth. fantastic. And working um, to develop a technology which is now um, being used to actually take these B cells <laughs> and amplify out and make these recombinant um, antibodies. So it's amazing. It is. It's remarkable. It is. So, Dixon, they get a couple of uh, monoclonals. Many. They had like nine or ten, I think. Well, that's not many. Well, <laughs> more than a couple, I guess. Consider the amount of work you hey, do by the way, after that. It's a lot. When I say a couple, what, what number would you Two. call Two is a couple? Two is a couple. Really? A a What's a few? More than two. Not nine, though, right? Depends on I how th- many I think others. That, <laughs> here in New York, we say a couple, two, three, no? Couples, two. <laughs> okay, Daniel, how many I, is I think it? <laughs> I, I was going to say it depends what you're like. Let's say you go to Africa and you're all excited. You hear about these fields of wildebeest and you see like maybe 12 or 15. You say, <laughs> we didn't see a lot. It was so only a, a couple few. of wildebeest. <laughs> there were only a few. few. We saw yeah, a few. Yeah, okay. That's right. Or That's you right. go to Midtown You go to Midtown, <laughs> and people tell you how many people you're going to see in New York City and you see like 50. You'd be like, there really weren't that many. There were only a few people on the street. So right. few, I think, is relative. Yeah. So they have, they have nine or so. So then <laughs> the first thing they do is they want to know if these work. Right. Tell us this in vitro assay. And that's an what? easy deal. You collect the antibody that each cell line produces. Right. right. You expose the sporozoites, live sporozoites that are untreated. These are living sporozoites from a mosquito that you get out of the uh, salivary glands. And now you have an in vitro um, um, hepatocyte. Cell Primary culture. human hepatocyte. That's right. And they can infect them with... Plasmodium falciparum. They can. What, what stage? A sporozoite, sporozoite, right? That's right. So if you, it's like a, you know what this is? It's like a viral neutralization test. It's exactly the same thing, Vincent. Yep. You expose the virus to the antibody, then you see if it infects, and if they don't, then it's a neutralizing antibody. This is a neutralizing antibody against Plasmodium falciparum. Do we want to lay a little bit of, I was just going to jump in with a little bit of the life cycle yeah. so people understand. So um, I, remember fond, I remember <laughs> fondly a heated um, interaction um, between you two. <laughs> I was hopefully not so heated about it. But um, it was about the issue. Is that, so a mosquito, right, has the salivary glands. Right. And, um, you know, one oocyst can produce 10,000 of these sporozoites, right? So tremendous amplification from that stage. And then they do this probing with their proboscis, and then they eventually, not always, they eventually get to a blood vessel, a capillary, sort of a heat signature thing. So some of these sporozoites are going into the tissue in the local area, but then, boom, they hit the blood supply, and in come the sporozoites, which then, in a matter of less than 10 minutes, will end up in hepatocytes. Correct. So this is a very short window That's where you need the, you know, if it's going to be antibody mediated, which it would sort of theoretically need to be, right? Because the T cells are not going to get here in time to do anything. It's in the circulation, so you need antibodies. And here's what we're doing is we're looking at assays where the antibodies will hopefully somehow interact with, neutralize the sporozoites before they can enter the hepatocytes. Correct. So we're, we're looking at the, the, the stage. Later on, we'll go from hepatocytes into the circulation, and we'll have the erythrocytic stages. Correct. And the other thing they do is they, they titer the antibodies. Yes. So they they actually use this hepatocyte system in culture to screen hundreds of monoclonals. That's what it is. They came down with four that really were effective at blocking invasion. Exactly. Right. And these are called CIS 23, 34, 42, 43 hike. Exactly. Right? Yes. All right. So they have four. Dose dependent inhibition of invasion. Now then, they go into two animal, two mouse model sticks, and tell us about the. So these mice, these mice are, they're not altered mice in that sense. They, they're, they're one, one strain of mouse is altered to to accept human blood cells, and allow replication of of the Plasmodium falciparum within the mouse. 
All right. So you can infect human red blood cells in vitro. Mm-hmm. And then you can infect the mouse with the human red cell infection, and it will undergo stages of replication for a while until the human red blood cells wear out or, or, or are used up by the uh, plasmonium infection. So it's an in vitro human. Uh, I'm sorry. It's an in vivo human using a mouse recipient. So that's a very altered mouse. So they have to accept these red blood cells from humans with the plasmodium. And the reason why they need that mouse model is that they have to prove stage specificity of immunity should they find immunity. So, so, And the other mouse model is the altered sporozoite for plasmodium burgii. It's now been altered to look like plasmodium falciparum. Okay. And those are regular mice. <sighs> That's regular mice. So, But they're infectious for mice. Okay? The, the only difference is the sporozoite, the sporozoite comes protein. from falciparum. It does. But it will still infect yes. as if it were Bergii. Because the rest of it is Bergii. The only thing that's not Bergii is the circumsporozoite. So that's gene. weird because you just said before bit. that the only thing on the outside is the circumsporozoite. That's right. Yet it's from falciparum and it's, it's still infecting. What they, yes, and it results in a... Because so they does that the mean, genes. They does that, mean the, that the circumsporite antigen either has... No role in invasion of hepatocytes, or the falciparum one works to invade, and then the Bergii genes take over. After. Now you got it. Okay. Now you got it. Now you got All it. Right. So you need two separate models to test in vivo the ability of neutralizing antibodies against these epitopes. Now, Daniel? Yes. What is this human liver chimeric mice? What is that? How do they make those? Yeah, so these were actually produced by the cap lag. I don't know if you guys have. And so that they. These mice actually can be infused with human red blood cells, and so you can actually get the, the I guess I'll call it the erythrocytic phase of malaria. Because um, what you're, you know, you, you don't want to be strutting this stuff in human beings, so you're creating these models, and different labs are created different models. Um, so I, I think Dixon pointed out initially they're just using um, the C57 black mice, mm-hmm. and then they're going to, you know, as we go further along, they're going to actually use this, this, FRG HU HEP mouse model. Right. And they have two different purposes. But they give these human liver cells. That's right. But- so, and the nice thing is you get to do the, you know, you get to do the rest of the life cycle because we don't want to just do okay. hepatic invasion. We want to follow right, it farther. Right, right. 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 So the first thing they do is they want to test in vivo the inhibitory effects of these monoclonal antibodies. Okay. So they inject them into the mice. And then they inject living, unaltered sporozoites from Plasmodium burgii. Okay. And they get a they get a reduction in infection depending on how much mm-hmm. uh, antibody they give, right? Yep. But one of them inhibits them completely. One antibody is very one. good. CIS two, uh, CIS forty three. Exactly. CIS forty three. Remember exactly. that. Crime scene investigation <laughs> 43. It would be CSI. So well, I'm, I'm dyslectic. Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, so it's sort, of, it's sort of nice the way they break this down. I think we're looking at figure two. At least I'm looking at figure two. And they, <laughs> um, you know, so the initial part is they're looking at this, you know, are they getting, um, you know, the, the first part of the cycle, we'll say, and then they're looking at the blood stage later on. And exactly. yeah, you're right. Exactly. CI. CIS-43 really stands out. It's a remarkable antibody, but there's a but. They don't know how it works. It, doesn't not, it does not affect the erythrocytic stage at all. Mm-hmm. So they can transfer in infected human red blood cells from an in vitro culture of plasmodium falciparum in a mouse that has received the anti-sporozoite antibody from this particular CIS-43. And it has no effect whatsoever on the rest of the life cycle. So it's very specific for the invasion of hepatocytes by the sporozoites. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what they wanted to see. And the, Okay, now they're and stuck. By the way, this, they used mosquitoes to deliver. They did. They, exactly right. So, so it, it's, it's, a, it's as much a reminiscent of a natural cycle yeah. as they can get, mm-hmm. given all these alterations that they've put into their system. So the next set of questions involves... Okay, what is this antibody against? How does it interfere with this? Right. Because prior to this, we never had anything that resulted in 100% protection. It was partial. Right. And we couldn't imagine another epitope. So we had we were stuck with trying to alter these epitopes 
into a more effective um, molecular vaccine and it, without success, total without success. People were frustrated by this result. And it turns out, Daniel, when you, you want to do the spoiler alert? I, I don't know if I can do it. No, you could do the spoiler alert. No, well, they found it. <laughs> what they did was they found that there is a, an epitope at the junction between, I believe it's the end terminus and the start of the repeated antigen in between. Junction at the end terminus and the central repeat domains. Yeah. That's right. It's the it's the junction it's called the epitope. epitope. And, it, and it has to be at a certain epi- uh, angle in order for this antibody to be effectively so they used, banned. They used a series of peptides. They did. And it's which ones bind this antibody. That's right. And that's this particular one, this C- CIS43, yes. bound this junction. Correct. Which was very unusual. The others didn't do it. Exactly. That. And and when they substituted tyrosine, as I recall, they they destroyed the epitope. Yeah, they, and it they, didn't made, have they made altered peptides. And they and, did some crystallography studies to show the totally. bindings. They, it, so they, they, they measured uh, binding. They did That's some right. binding They did two-layer interferometry. Isothermal titration, <laughs> calorimetry, <it. laughs> and this CIS-43 has two modes of binding. Two? It has two binding sites. Is that with, a monoclonal with antibody? Different, well, uh. it, it is. It, it is. is. But they have two different affinities. So prob- yeah, they have two. That's right. That's exactly right. And it first binds one, exactly and then it binds right. the second. How interesting, yes. And they believe that um, the first binding of CIS-43 at the junctional epitope induces conformational changes in the in the epitope, right. which then allows the second site to engage. And this it isn't done by any other antibody that they've ever seen before. Correct. So this is something they got this from a patient, or that's right, a person that's exactly. who was who was immunized. <laughs> exactly, it's amazing. Yeah, right? and they also do crystallography of the antibody. They do plus the the uh, epitope, the epitope, the epitope, and they see exactly where it's binding. Sure, and, and they can confirm that you know it's at the junctional. This is good stuff. Epitope. This is really good stuff. So, and it, and so the idea in the end is that the reason this is so effective is because this is a hidden epitope. Right. Which is only exposed upon bind, the binding of the monoclonal antibody. Conformational epitope. Yeah, it's, exactly right. so. it's, it's a mixture. First it binds to this junctional epitope, yeah, and then it induces the exposure of the other one. And they say that <clears throat> the uh, this this second epitope has probably um, been hidden by the, the, the primary epitope, which is immunodominant. And that's why you mostly get monoclonals against that, and, and they don't completely block infection. It's only if you get against the second. Exactly. Right, Daniel? You agree with that? I, I do. This sort of reminds me, right, of the stock targeting of the influenza. Ah. Uh, mm-hmm. Universal vaccines is trying to hit something that normally the immune system is not going to target. That's right. Same thing with the HIV, the the immuno, they're, they're immunosubdominant, but they're broadly neutralizing. Exactly. That, that hit these these epitopes, but this one is a, is a little different because this um this this sequence that is bound by CAS forty three is hidden by the immunodominant epitope, right? And it, it's only exposed when the antibody binds, and there's a little conformational change in the uh, in right. the sequence. So it's like it makes a, it even yeah, it makes it more sophisticated, right? So you, you need like <laughs> and, and you you were bringing this. Is it monoclonal? I mean, so antibodies can have double binding sites. So people often think of this lock and key model, but this is like no, 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 yeah, two two keys, right? The first one goes in, opens up, and then the second one but the locks binding kind, in and neutralizes. Yeah, the binding constants are different. For yep. these two epitopes, yep. right? So, so now this this sequence, this uh, junctional epitope, yep. they say it's conserved in ninety nine point eight percent among exactly. all the strains that have been recovered globally. Exactly. So this is a highly conserved. So that means it's going to work for most right, right, right. Uh, and so you could either give people this monoclonal passive protection, right? Yeah, and you know they say that there are some situations maybe. Travelers, military personnel, or if you want to eliminate, you could give people this infected people. Now, if you're already infected, is is it not gonna it's not gonna clear it? No, of course not. Yeah, it's too late. It's too late. It's much too late. So what they say elimination campaigns <laughs> in combination with mass administration of anti malarial drugs. So how why would this be useful for that? It prevents new infections. New right? infections only. Yeah. So you if, Dan- get- if Daniel, if you're going somewhere and instead of taking um Malarone or something. Something like that. you would take this, which would last maybe a month. 
or it might be longer than that. It could it, last you longer. Know, you can, yeah, you can actually modify them yeah. now in, in like six months, maybe, let's say. Yeah, so you, can, you could you potentially can... give everyone, let's say you got your troops, you're about to send your troops in somewhere, right? Because, of right. course, you know, that's money comes from that. Um, you give everyone their vaccine, mm-hmm. uh, but it isn't a vaccine, right? It's almost like the gamma globulin shots in the old days. You give everyone yeah. their their modified monoclonal antibodies like like prolia, denosumab, some of these um, antibodies we use, Remicade, things where we're using antibodies mm-hmm. and we modify them so they have a six-month, um, we'll say half-life. And then when they get exposed, when they get bitten by a mosquito, the sporozoites are neutralized before they can enter the liver cells. Correct. Of course, these monoclones would have to first be humanized yep. for use in humans, so they're not eliminated by the immune response. Then they could be pegylated or modified chemically, so they last a long time. Okay, exactly. That's, yeah, that's the cool. pegylation is a way to do that. Then the other thing they say is, how could that's we? That's polyethylene glycol. You mean polyethylene glycol? Okay. Yeah, it will increase the half life, and there are other okay. ways too. And they say maybe how can we figure out how to induce an antibody response against this epitope? A molecular vaccine. How, a real vaccine where you would give the protein. Right. How do we deliver it in a way? Right. So it's harder because. You have to have this angle. Yeah, this <laughs> angle thing. And, and now it obviously happens sometimes because that's they got this monoclonal from people who were immunized with sporozoites. And, so. and were challenged and shown to be totally resistant. Right. So. You have to figure out that it was a rare monoclonal. Very people, rare. So you Very know, rare. it's hard. It's the same thing with these broadly neutralizing HIV antibodies. They're pretty rare, and they require a lot of somatic hypermutation during during maturation in, in the B cell, in the germinal center. So it's hard to do. That's once, a challenge. Once you have it, it's gold. Well, yeah, but it may take you 100 years. <laughs> I don't know. But right now they have a passive uh, yeah, candidate, which they, they could- We'll have to do a little more animal testing and humanize exactly. it, animal testing, and then maybe clinical trials. Exactly. Now, Daniel. They have a bright yeah. future, I'd say. And you, this will be expensive. Monoclonals are expensive, right? You know, let's see. There's a there's a new migraine drug, right, that just got FDA approved this mm-hmm. week. Mm-hmm. And um, they're, they're going to sell it to retail price of, I think, $600 an injection. Ouch. Um, well, but when you look at malaria drugs, right? Um, you know, malaria drugs are not cheap. Mm. Um, so, you know, you're, you're in sort of the, you know, you're, you can get yourself into the, and again, we know those prices are just sort of invented, shall I say. To uh, cover the cost of other research that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. So this is true. So what is, yeah, what is the Malarone price right now? I think it's, um, so no 24, 24 tablets is $180. So it's about $200 a month for your malaria prophylaxis. So $600 for an injection, you're, you're kind of getting into the ballpark for, let's say you want to send the troops in, you don't need them to remember to take their pill every day, or you've got Correct. a traveler and you can say, hey, I'm going to give you a shot. And let's say it lasts for six months, that's 1200 Well, okay, you've actually, you've, you know, you're starting to hit your price point. The challenge I, I see here, right, is that, you know, initially when I read this, I'm thinking of the universal influenza vaccine. I'm thinking, oh, so now that we know the target, you could expose the immune system and create immunoglobulins to that. But it's tough because, um, as we discussed, it's these two different targets and it's this conformational change. I don't know how we can give something um, as opposed to use some kind of like a gene manipulation where we give you the sequence and have your B cells start to do it. So another question I have then is the idiotypic and anti-idiotypic antibodies. So the anti-idiotyp is the mirror okay, image. Get, aren't we supposed to be nice to Dixon? We're not supposed to do you, But this is you. Using that. <laughs> stop it. Just stop it. Let me ask the question first, then laugh. <laughs> okay. I don't think anything you're saying is idiotypic. I, I, no, no, no. What I'm asking is if you had the anti if you had the uh, anti-idiotypic antibody, yes. well, that's a reflection of the antigen itself. Yeah, that's right. But we have the peptide, so we don't need Can that. You, it has the right angle, though. The peptide is not essential. The angle is essential. So this anti-idiotypic antibody has the right angle. Yeah, well, I'm, I guess so could you immunize the, against the infection yeah. using the anti-idiotypic antibody? So that's the whole challenge, right? Is that that whole thinking? So we're going back to um, to yearns right who has came up with this idea that right. for every antibody there's another antibody which actually is sort of the <laughs> antigenic complement right. but when you start getting to a double epitope antibody it's you start getting tough. kind of complicated it's pretty tough, pretty tough. Mm. yeah no, no i got all my uh, 
usable knowledge by listening to Elvin Cabot. So that's pretty so ancient. Is, one of their peptides, but, peptide 21, is this that's the junction region, and they may be able to start with that. And just inject that and see if it gives rise to. I'll bet they're working something. on it right now. Well, of course they are. This is already, you know, this is already uh, published. It's a year old. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. It so was a big great. collaboration of NIH, Johns Hopkins, MIT, Duke, yep. and a company, Scenaria, which right. makes the whole sporozoid vaccine. Yeah, that's uh, actually Stephen Hoffman's wife. One of the one of the tough things, right, is is there's two populations that we worry about with malaria. So the, there's the people going into endemic areas who are not normally there, and then there's people living in these resource limited areas. And um, the, right. you know, unless we can really do something here as far as creating an ability to stimulate a vaccine, and I, maybe the anti-idiotype network, um, you know, the Neil's journey approach, which um, I know some. Cuban research is working on where you don't actually give the direct antigen, but you somehow understand the network enough to give something that's three steps away that triggers it. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause that's what ultimately we need. You know, we don't need a $600 per injection, no, 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 no. you know, approach that's just financially unaffordable for the people. Yeah. But the army right. can afford anything so that this isn't going to stop them from doing that. Yeah. For the, for the military. And uh, Steve right. Hoffman, just to, for the record was in the Navy, not the army. All right, let's uh, move on. We're approaching two hours, and we need yeah, to we need a hero. Up, so give us a hero. Then we'll have a case, and then we'll I'll wrap it. Give you up. a hero right now. I'm holding out for a hero. Well, that's a famous song, you know. I don't know that song. No, you. I'm don't. singing it in my head. You know really? that one, Daniel? I'm oh, I love out that. For a it's hero? a great song. It was, wasn't Who there a movie it? Streets Streets of Fire? Holding out for a hero is like the theme maybe, of it. Maybe. Who sings it? <laughs> um, I'll tell you who sings it. Bee Gees. <laughs> uh, well, it was originally recorded in 1984 by Welsh singer Bonnie Tyler Bonnie for the Tyler. soundtrack to the film Footloose. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, Footloose. So it's Pat, Patrick Swayze? Was don't he know. in that movie? That I don't know. All right. So here's our hero. His name is Carlos Justiniano Rubiero Chagas, <laughs> and he was a, a, an MD. He lived from 1879 to 1934. And here's what we say about him in our blurb. Working as a physician in rural Brazil, Carlos Chagas determined that the most recent seasonally mortality rate was not entirely due to malaria, as many had died with no malarial parasites demonstrable in their bloodstream. Instead, he observed that the vinchuca bug otherwise known as the Reduvidi, as Vincent so likely, he likes to say that name, had trypanosomes in their gut tract and made the association between the bugs and the infection in people by finding trypanosomes in the blood of a young infected girl. He went on to describe many of the clinical features of what was to become known as American trypanosomiasis. He named it Trypanosoma cruzi after his friend and mentor, Oswaldo Cruz. Chagas went on to discover Pneumocystis carinii, renamed Pneumocystis gerovecchi, an opportunistic fungal infection that ravaged HIV-slash-AIDS patients at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. He is revered in Brazil, uh, and in fact, uh, at one point, they um, reproduced the life cycle of Trypanosoma cruzi on the Cruzero, the, the money. Mm -hmm. And on the back, they had his picture of Carlos Chagas. So there's, there's no higher recognition of, of achievement than having your picture on the money of the country that you come from, but also his accomplishments and, and how this life cycle occurs. That The whole life cycle was on the money. You could learn about Chagas disease just by, on the money. by buying some candy. And it was a 10,000... A Crucero note. I have it someplace. It's great that they put the life cycle on. It was yeah. fabulous. Good Never happened health. in this country. Great. Never happened. <laughs> you think they'd ever put the HIV life cycle on a dollar bill? No. Or how you catch it. <laughs> That's even more important. All right. Thank you. Mm. Daniel, well, you have a new case for us? I do. Really? Dude, this is our last <laughs> this is our this is our last case. Yep. No. Um so it was Kevin Bacon, by the way, in Footloose. Just thought I would throw that. Kevin you know, when Bacon. I was oh, when yes. I was younger, people used to say I looked like Kevin Bacon. Six degrees so, of freedom. Anyway. Uh but I am not related to Kevin Bacon. You're not tall enough. Okay. <laughs> um all right. So this is gonna be our last case 
in Panama before oh, we mm-hmm. return to the U.S. So oh, okay. a little, little sad, but we're going to have to go home after this one. Oh, well. So this is a uh, a gentleman. He's in his 40s, and he's in this little Nabe village. And so it, people can picture again. We've traveled a few hours by boat. We've gone up this river. We're in the little village. And this um, man comes to see us. He's in his 40s. And um, he is concerned. He also has diarrhea. Um, but this is a this isn't the loose stools. He actually says, "I've been having diarrhea for um, several weeks," uh, and he is actually reporting that he notices when he is able to view the the semi form stool that there's actually blood mixed in the stool, not just on the outside, but actually mixed in the stool. Um, he says it's been going on for. Um, and say about three weeks. Uh, he reports um, he hasn't any weight changes. He doesn't have any fever, but he just feels tired. Uh, tired. And again, he lives in this small, isolated native village in Panama with lots of animals, insects. The toilets are over water. Remember, he's getting his uh, drinking water from um, the rooftop collections from the tin roof. He lives in one of these homes with a wooden slat floor. Lots of pigs, dogs, chickens. No electricity. Um, he's married. He has several children. He says no one else is sick. And when we examine this uh, gentleman, he has um, mild abdominal tenderness, uh, mainly in sort of the lower areas of the bowel. So sort of lower belly, um, a little bit more on the left. Uh, he has a normal rectal exam, right? So here's a man in his 40s. And, you know, some of the things we think about are not just infectious. But we also want to see if there's uh, maybe hemorrhoids, which would usually be blood on the outside of the stool, which he did not report. We didn't visualize any hemorrhoids. Otherwise, exam was normal. And much like the last um, patient, we're in this remote village. So we're going to try to put together this um, differential for three weeks of bloody diarrhea and come up with a treatment plan. Mm. Right. Are there questions that uh, you gentlemen might have? Now, this came on about three weeks ago. Before that, he was fine, right? He, a healthy, um, strong man, doing well, and no prior problems. So three weeks ago was the onset. Lives by himself? Uh, no, he's married and has several children. Lives in one of these um, little little homes up mm. on stilts above the water. Nobody else in the family is sick? Nobody else is sick. Right. And what does he do for a living? Uh, he works in the fields, like many of the other men in the village. In, hmm, that doesn't help. <laughs> what does he's, he not do? a, he's a farmer. He, he, he's a farmer. Yeah. He's a farmer. Okay. Okay. Farmer with three weeks of bloody diarrhea. Right. Huh. Farmer. No with- unusual <laughs> eating or drinking habits, I presume, but everything there is unusual. No, <laughs> no, no. And he does, you know, like many of these people, I know my daughter, uh, Daisy was commenting, um, about this actually this morning at four o'clock when I was dropping her at the airport, that it's amazing. These people only drink about a cup of water a day. Oh my um, goodness. So is that, and then may hear you on the tropics and there's just, there's just not that much water. And so they're drinking only about one cup wow. a day of water. Hmm. That's wow. Yep. He was. What's so there, a, what's the molarity of water, by the way? I'm sorry. <laughs> what's, what's the molarity of water? Oh, the molarity is, I guess it's one. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, 55 moles per liter. 55 moles per liter. I don't know. I just thought you. Isn't it 55.5? But just, you know. You yeah, really, pretty, really yeah. shouldn't ask me things right. like that, Vincent, because we're on the air and I, I hate embarrassing myself in a, such a large audience. Well, I looked it up. That's and they I all knew. winced. <laughs> you meant water. You meant water density. I did. I did. I, yeah, I met you know. one. Yes. yes. The usual answer is a trick question. <laughs> um, oh, I think we're, we're good. We're going to diagnose. Have you got it, Dixon? I, no, I need some more data. That's so you just, can't have any more data. You don't have, have enough you data. You have to do a differential. That's right. We can do that. So hopefully our emailers will write in. And, um, you know, this is much like the last time. We're going to look at this. We're going to say, what is the most probable? What are, what are we going to, are we going to empirically treat this? Because um, we're not going to be back for uh, three months. Bloody diarrhea is uh, it's serious stuff. So this is also called dysentery. It's called dysentery. Exactly. Yes. And That's right. So it's very interesting that Daniel said it's not just blood on the outside, which would be by if you had bleeding Injury tumor. If you had a tumor, Daniel, right. in your That's colon, right. you would be on the outside of the, the feces or would it be mixed sure. in? 
So it depends. You know, that's a that's a good comment. It depends how low down it is. So your your classic on the outside would be I'm straining and I've got hemorrhoids. And that's going to be bright red on the outside. Um, let's say you have a right sided um, colonic cancer. Mm-hmm. So let's say in the cecum area, sometimes it can be mixed in. So yeah, this is not. Um, but you said this is dysentery, so this is not formed stool. So it's mixed into a fluid, basically. Well, it's semi formed stool. Semi. Um, and it's been going on for three weeks. I think that's important. The chronicity, I'll say, is, I think, important. Um, if someone came and said, boy, it's been about six months, I'm losing weight, and I've got um, blood mixed in my stool, um, that would I would react a little differently. And lower GI tenderness, you said? Um, on the lower left side, mainly. Lower left. But yeah. Okay. Remember, some people uh, in the previous case mentioned a cause of dysteria, but there's no blood in the previous no, I think case. You have a burst appendix, but that's that's. And of course, there are bacteria that cause dysentery, right? Absolutely. That, Hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, many. That's important. Yeah, I, I think people should realize that we've always been sort of like, okay, it's going to be a parasite, but this time I can say, well, let's think about. It. Here we are in this remote village, and. Um, you know, he doesn't know, and I'm going to talk about him on Twip. He just knows that he's got these <laughs> it's symptoms. true. This is true. And I'm just there to try to help him. So right. uh, and, and we'll let did, people, you know, your, your differential, I'm going to encourage people to be a little broader. Let's talk about things that might not be parasitic, and what should we do if those are in our differential? And, and we did have a penguin once for a primary host for a malaria case. So, that <laughs> you know, we, we do these things every now and then, <laughs> just to shake them up. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let me just... Uh, maybe yes. it, are there more than one parasite that causes dysentery? There can be. There can be. There can. Be. Yes. Yes, of course. Okay. That's right. Blood in the stool. I mean, that's yeah, that has a lot of possibilities actually. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you, Daniel. And oh. um we are wrapping up TWIP 152. You can find it at microbe.tv slash twip if you have guesses. Remember, we randomly pick a um, a guesser to get a, <laughs> a copy of the sixth edition of Parasitic That's Diseases. True. That's true. So whether you're right or not, you can still get the book. And um, so so try it out. You know, it's, um, it's not something that stops in the spring and summer. You know, you can keep trying all summer, right? Exactly. And send those guesses to twip at microbe.tv. If you would like to support us financially so that we can do more travel, hire people to help us out, et cetera, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You know, if everyone gave a buck a month, that'd be great. It would be. And um, I did give out the email, twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Grifford is at Columbia University Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. There you go. Gracias, Dixon. De nada. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to Ronald Jenkins for his music and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic. <laughs> <laughs>